Good evening, Hope Reformed Baptist Church. Can you please open with me to Hebrews chapter 12? Hebrews chapter 12, as we consider our, continue I mean, our consideration, our study, our, our thoughting, our thinking, our thoughting. Wow, tonight's going to be a good one. Our, our thoughting and our spoking uh, as we go through the topic, the, the, the idea, the doctrine, the image, the truth and the reality of the blood of Jesus Christ for sinners. Hebrews chapter 12, would you look at verse 22, once we're all there. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 22. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22 to 24. Let me give you some context. The writer of the book of Hebrews, if I constantly say, Paul, forgive me, that's who I think wrote it, that's in the back of my mind. The writer of the book of Hebrews is basically telling these Christian, former Jews, but Israelite Christians, that they don't need to go back into, I'm going to bang this. Sorry, whoever... That's annoying. I'm going to break my hand on that soon. Uh, (coughs) He is telling the Israelite Christians not to be tempted to go back into temple worship because there is all the glory. There is the amazing heritage of spiritual lineage and tradition, etc. The writer of the Hebrews is saying, don't be tempted to go back there. And then he sort of points to what we can't see, but what is true in heaven right now for everybody that has faith in Jesus. And it's as if he's saying, I'm not saying that at church there's something of more gold or there's something more beautiful than the temple. I'm not saying that. I can't promise that. What I can promise you is this, that when we gather, we have pressed in to what we can't see. And we're standing among an enormous congregation that we can't visibly see, but it's there. And by faith in Jesus, we are there with them. And this is what every gathering of the church is by faith. For those, you know, it it strikes me to say that there are some right here now as we gather here and you're not in that gathering. You're merely meeting humanly, merely physically. You're here and most of us are there, I pray, but many of us, some of us aren't. Many people who go into churches are not there. But the point is this, that true Christians, as they gather humanly to hear the gospel, they are really joining the congregation around the throne of God in heaven. And this is what he describes. He says, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God. That's pictures of heaven. The heavenly Jerusalem. And to uncountable angels. Maybe your version says thousands upon thousands or myriads of myriads of angels. That's thousand times a thousand, which is a lot, I assure you. He says innumerable angels in festal gathering. You think angels look good in the visions of the Old Testament. You wait till you see heaven. They're they're celebrating. They're not merely glorious and flying winged in front of God's glory. They are are robed with party gathering festal outfits because Jesus the King is enthroned. The innumerable angels in festal gathering and to the church of the firstborn or the assembly, the ecclesia, the gathering of the firstborn. That is every soul in heaven is a firstborn son in Jesus Christ with Full inheritance rights. You're the firstborn. We're coming to that church of the firstborn who are enrolled in the books of heaven and to God. You are coming by faith in Jesus to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. Every saint that has gone on into heaven gathers there now around God and his throne. And to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. And I'm sure that as soon as I say covenant or mediator, immediately Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Exodus flies to your mind and says, ah, the shedder of the blood between God and man. It's what a mediator does in biblical covenants. Jesus, we have come to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, And to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. May God bless this wonderful word in our midst this evening. 
This is the image that Paul is saying, that if you are together by Christ, by faith, In Christ, gathered, we are really joining an invisible gathering that is currently happening in heaven. This is everything that is true of you as a Christian. We started out our series by saying blood is necessary because there is no forgiveness of sins without the shedding of blood. We saw last week that blood is, that Jesus' blood is perfect, is unblemished, is, it is spotless, and that's why he was able to be our Passover lamb. Tonight, our consideration is that Jesus' blood is loud because Jesus' blood speaks. And it speaks so loud that the writer of Hebrews could hear it above all of the angels and above all of their flapping wings. And above the trumpets that that parade in heaven and the shouts of praise, he heard the word of blood. This book, Hebrews, is written right right in the middle of really of the Bible when, 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 when Jesus came and after he left and the apostle wrote it. He's looking to the end of history or what is true even right now in heaven. But the language that he's using of blood speaking, Abel's blood speaking, actually goes all the way back to the beginning of the Bible. So let's go there. Can you go back with me to Genesis chapter 4? Genesis, we are three weeks into this series and we are not really out of the first couple of books of the Bible. I know. (coughs) But Genesis chapter 4 is where this language of Abel's blood speaking begins. Genesis chapter 4. Look at verse 8. Genesis chapter 4. If you're new to the Bible, glad that you're here. Genesis is the first book. I hope it's easy to find. First book and chapter 4, verse 8. It says this, Cain, Cain, the firstborn of Adam and Eve. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother. And that when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother, Abel, and killed him. Was it a beating? Was it a stabbing? Was it a... A live burial? Was it a a grappling and a choking? We don't know. But we know that he extinguished his life and shed his blood. Verse 9. Then Yahweh said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? And he said, I do not know. And and besides, am I still responsible for for that pipsqueak, my little brother Abel? Am I his protector? Am I his babysitter? Am I his keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's brother's blood from your hand. The blood of Abel was shed, whether that means physically the blood spilt or whether it merely means that his life was extinguished, maybe like strangling. Regardless, the biblical imagery of blood, again, is not merely a red red liquid. It is the life value that every human being carries in them, even though we are sinners, because we are made in the image of God. This is what Genesis 9 says. God's speaking to Noah generations later. After a very sinful... uh, 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 generation after he's just flooded them all and yet still he tells Noah that if man sheds another man's blood then by men shall his blood be shed you die capital crime you die for murdering somebody else because the and, and he reasons that out God says for man is made in the image of God didn't you read Genesis chapter 1 Mankind is in the image of God and therein lies our infinite value not because of ourselves or our ability. We don't have infinite merit. We can't make an infinite payment, but we are valuable, more valuable than anything else in creation. And therefore, when it says that the blood is crying out to God, the blood of your brother Abel, God means the image that I stamped upon you, my, my son Abel, your brother Abel, is now defaced and lying in the dirt. The flag which said created by God in his image to glorify him and enjoy him forever. That flag, that banner lies in tatters in the dirt cane and you put it there. My image, my value, my creation has now been shed, destroyed, killed and it lies dead 
in the ground. And though it had been buried, yet it cries out. Verse 11 says that God tells Cain, even though the, 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 the blood, the ground, which opened up to swallow your brother's blood. You see what's happening here? That, that Cain had obviously killed his brother, that he had dug a pit or a hole or found a ravine or, or a cavern of some kind. He threw his brother, maybe he found a, a, a hole in a cave. And he threw his brother's limp body into there and rolled a large stone over it. Maybe he did that. Maybe he merely buried him a few feet deep in the ground. And God says, do you think a few layers of dirt is able to silence the cries of justice to me? Though he is buried, yet he speaks and he cried out to God. <clears throat> My question for you is, what does it cry out? What did Abel's blood cry out to God? Because by understanding that, whatever it is that Abel's blood cried out, then we were able to understand what the writer of the Hebrews means when he says Jesus' blood cries out something better. What does Abel's blood cry out? It cries out, first of all this, we touched on this, that what has been shed was made in the image of God and therefore something of unmeasurable value is lying dead. That's what it said. First of all, God, one of your creatures, your, your, your sons, one of the human beings that you have made in your image lies dead. It screams out the value of human life. That's the first thing that Abel's blood screams. The second thing is that it cries out the innocence of Abel's life. As God listened to that blood crying out to him through the dirt, out of the earth, up into heaven, how loud that blood must cry. God's ears turned towards the earth to seek and to apply justice and he hears the crying of innocent blood. And he looks at that and what that blood is telling him is not the absolute and perfect innocence of Abel. No, of course not. He was a sinner. Therefore, God could kill him and it would be just. But Cain could not kill him. Abel had not committed a social, human level, capital crime for which God would justly punish him with death by another man's hand. What was Abel's sin? Do you remember Abel's sin? Abel's sin was just being more righteous than Cain. Cain was just jealous. He was envious. He didn't make the sacrifice of blood, which Hebrews tells us in verse 11, chapter 11, verse 4, is the sacrifice of faith. God didn't look upon Cain's sacrifice with pleasure. Cain had murderous intents in his heart. And even though chapter 4 tells us that God came to Cain, said, sin is crouching at your door. Rule over it. Control it. Muzzle it. Cage it. Do it away. Or it will rule over you. It will have you. It will sink its teeth in. Still, Cain said no. And he shed his brother's blood instead of shedding a sacrificial blood. And so what is crying out to God is the innocence of Abel's life. That is the judicial, the, the, the comparative or relative innocence of Abel's blood. He may not be a perfect man, but he did not deserve to die by Abel's hand. So it cried out the innocence to God. It also cried out the death of his line. This is how ancient Jewish uh, uh, scholars actually uh, receive and understand uh, a language of murder. In fact, they sort of interpret it even in some of uh, uh, their scriptures that the blood of all of the lineage of Abel cries out to me. Because they understand in their law system that to kill a man or a woman is not merely to kill them, it is to kill all of the children that potentially could have come from them. To kill a man is to kill a nation. To kill a woman is to kill a line. An entire, entire descendancy of human beings that is to snuff out what could have been a glorious tree right at its root. That's what he has done. And therefore, every potential line of Abel that could have been a saving, a, a righteous influence in the earth was gone. And Cain and his type were now the majority. No wonder the flood. Fourthly, Cain, Abel's blood cried out, the guilt of Cain's actions. It first cried out infinite life. A, a human life is shed. Secondly, it cried out innocence of his life. Thirdly, it cried out that uh, his whole lineage is gone. And now it is also crying out that Cain is the perpetrator. So after hearing the crying of Abel's blood, he then goes and finds Cain. Cain, I hear your brother's voice. I don't see your brother's body. Where is he? Cain, in his, answer, in his question, or, or am I my brother's keeper? God could have said, yes, 
you are responsible for your brother, for you took his life. What did you do with it? Can you bring it back? Can you speak a word and give him life again? Can you, can you revive his body? No, then you're responsible for taking it. It spoke out to God what only the secret of Abel's blood could have known, which was who the aggressor was. It spoke the mystery to God that no human could have known. Adam wouldn't have known. Eve wouldn't have known. Who killed Abel? Where did Abel go? Abel's blood told the omniscient God who sees all. Fifthly, it called for the condemnation and cursing of Cain. This is what the blood did. It cried out and said, this is true, God. Cain killed me. I was innocent and Cain killed me. So I call on you to take action. Curse him. Kill him. Atone for me by striking him. Put my wounds upon his head. Put the iniquity that was put into my life upon in victimhood. Put it upon his life as the aggressor. Abel's blood called out for an action and vengeance from God. And sixthly, it does not stop until its voice is heard and its request is fulfilled. Abel's blood did not merely peep. It did not merely shoot a flare up to heaven. It remains until that blood guilt we see in the rest of the Pentateuch. This kind of uh, theme comes out that if somebody is killed, their blood is on the murderer's head and that blood guilt stands loudly, neon, flashing sign, huge siren going in the ears. It continues to speak until the murderer is killed then the blood can rest. That blood of Abel did not cease until, it's, until God heard it and received and fulfilled its just request. Therefore, Calvin says in his exposition of Genesis, he says, though Abel may have gone quietly into his grave, after death, the voice of his blood was more vehement than any eloquence of the orator. We don't receive in Scripture a single mention of what Abel said in his death and his dying. We only, we only see that Cain spoke to Abel, that Cain rose up against Abel. And as far as the scriptural testimony goes, he was as quiet and silent as a lamb. But in his death, he screamed. And he spoke with more vehemence than any eloquence of the orator, Calvin says. So this is sort of a picture for us. This is how God views our guilt. This is how God views your sin and my sin. As God looks from heaven and he sees us as a society, as a nation, as families, as a street, as a, as a country, as a state. Uh, as he, he looks down and he peers into our souls and our hearts and our consciences and the motivations and the inclinations of our hearts. God sees guilt as blood crying out, marking people for God's judgment. That is that it is on their head. As God looks upon us, we have blood over our faces. We have blood on our head. And that's the language of the Old Testament. That if somebody kills somebody or allows somebody to be killed that they were responsible for protecting, or if somebody accidentally kills somebody, that's manslaughter, it is said that their blood is on their head. You can even notice this in the New Testament. This is language of you're responsible for your own death when someone like Paul says, your blood be upon your own head. I tried preaching the gospel to you and you're persecuting me. You don't want it. Blood is upon the head of every murderer. Everybody who has extinguished somebody's life, God looks from heaven and he sees blood on your head. That means that if you have snuffed out the life of another and nobody else knows it, but you have a history of murder in this room, God sees blood upon your head. And that includes the secret, the private, the clinical sin of murder called abortion today. If intentional, chemically, or surgically paid for your girlfriend or mistress or had yourself an abortion, that means you're guilty of murder. And God sees the blood of your child upon your head. If you've partaken in medicinal or hospital grade or legally allowed murder through some kind of putting somebody to death because they didn't want to live, God sees their blood upon your head. But it's even more than this because Jesus told us that anybody who has hatred, anger, bitterness towards somebody is to have 
murder in their heart. And Romans 3 then says, that as a universal testimony of every single person on earth, it says their hearts are quick to shed blood. So I'm telling you on the, on the authority of Scripture, if you've never even tried to kill somebody, I'm telling you, that's only because you haven't had the opportunity that avails itself enough relative freedom and innocence yet. In other words, if you could, and you would get away with it, and you knew that for certain, all of us have hated somebody enough to do it. We're all guilty. All of us. If we could, we would have. Therefore, every single one of us, as God looks upon us, is found, none of us is bloodless. And so it continues to say, that Paul says in Romans 6 verse 23, that the wages of every sin is death. And so, and so even our own soul's blood is upon our head. <clears throat> Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And therefore, God looks upon us and sees sinful Blood upon every single one of our heads. We all stand legally blood guilty before God. We have blood on our hands because we have broken the law of God. As the blood of Abel cried out to God from the ground where it was shed, so also the law of God being broken by us sits, sits bleeding in the dirt as we've broken every single one of its precepts laws by either not doing what it commanded enough or doing what it commanded us not to do, either by commission or omission, by, by failure or by transgression. All of us, we are sinful. We have the blood of the law of God, which was sprinkled with blood when it was first delivered to symbolize this. We have the blood of the law of God on our hands. Every single one of us has blood guilt from God. Let me tell you, as we look at chapter four of Genesis, let me tell you the things that could never silence the blood of Abel. What things could never silence the voice of Abel's blood? First of all, lies. The Lord said to Cain in verse nine, where is Abel your brother? And he said, I do not know. How many of us would try this? God asks to us, where is the child you had in your womb? I don't know. Where is the money that you stole? I do not know. Where is the person that you hated in your heart? Where is your love for them? Oh, I do not know what you're talking about, God, and we play dumb. We li lies can never be heard by a perfectly just God louder than the truth of the blood that is upon our head. Lies can never wash away your sin. Lies can never silence the voice of Abel's blood. Put, uh, uh, Cain says, I don't know. I'm innocent of this question. I'm, in, I'm innocent by ignorance. I have, I have plausible ignorance before the law of God. I'm sure I'll play dumb. I don't know what he's talking about. I'll lie my way around. But Psalm 90 verse 8 tells us, God, you have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. Is if every single one of us is this microscopic, pathetic little worm. And God has taken each of us with a blazing clinical white light and put us right beneath the microscope of his glorious gaze and he misses nothing. He sees down to every atom that makes up our pathetic little sinning body, our life. There's nothing that has escaped from him. Under his glorious radiance, he sees with a, with a penetrating sight everything that we've thought, said, and wished we'd done. So no, lies could not silence the voice of Abel's blood. Neither could his protestation of innocence. Look at what he says next. He says, I, I, I don't know, lie. And then he at least tries to wash his hands. I'm not my brother's keeper anyway. There was extenuating circumstances, God. I'm sure I'm not as guilty as you're saying. I'm not actually responsible for that. That law didn't apply to me. My motivations were different. I'm not really sure. Can't I plead some kind of innocence? Protestations against God's standards of justice will avail nobody against the voice of the blood that cries out against us. Cain's protesting. I'm not my brother's keeper. This didn't, it wasn't on my case. This is not on my hands. Blood uh, all over his hands, spiritually and covenantally. And he shoved them behind himself saying, God, this is not my responsibility. It did not make God abate or turn away an inch or a moment. Protesting that you are innocent, friends, before a holy God who knows your guilt. That is, you're not lying anymore. You're just trying to convince God that his law is 
too severe. It shouldn't apply the way he's thinking it should. He should really let you off. Are you really responsible for all the guilt that have happened to you? Will you make some kind of excuse like Abel? It was my upbringing. It was this. It was what happened against me. It was what I was taught. I was ignorant. Are you going to try and bend God's law and protest that you can get through on a loophole? It will not avail. None of those, none of those protestations, even, even I think not just the non-Christian who sits here now deeply hoping, and I pray and hope every Sunday, but I, I'll tell you right now, I pray and hope that you are being crushed under the weight of the blood that condemns you. I pray that you are very, very uncomfortable every time you come to church if you're a non-Christian. I hope everybody makes you very comfortable. I hope the word of God and the spirit of God and the law of God and your sin on your heart makes you deeply, deeply uncomfortable. I hope it makes you shake like a china shop in an earthquake. I hope it makes you quiver and sweat. I hope it makes you scared to take another breath lest it be your last. I pray that God's word shakes you from your sleepiness, reminds you of your guilt, and points you towards Jesus. I hope that is true of you. Stop trying to declare your innocence. But I hope also for Christians, knowing that every sin has been forgiven you, that you don't try this in your life. You don't try and downplay who's really responsible or what you should really be doing or, or how bad sin really was. I mean, it happened to me. I didn't do it. I slipped up. I didn't commit a sin. I fell into it. I didn't rebel. Don't do that. Don't protest innocence where there is blood guilt against God's law. Here's the third thing that could not silence the voice of Abel's blood, the burial of his righteous brother. Verse 11 again, we see, And now you're cursed from the ground which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. Isn't that graphic language? It's as if the mouth, the, or the, 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 the ground, sorry, this ground created by God is personified and it opens its mouth wide with its throat gaping open and, and, and Abel pours a bowl of blood into the ground from his own hands. And from that place where the blood was shed, from that place where the burial was committed, from that place where Abel's dead corpse lay and blood was sprinkled, from that place, a, a Cain's cursing, Cain's cursing was being projected by the voice of his brother. Burial, the removal of the evidence, the hiding, the suppression of it all could not silence Abel's blood. I wonder if you've tried this in your life. How many things you've kept very, very, very secret and no one else knows about it. No one except, of course, the holy triune God who sees you. I wonder if you've deleted all of the internet tabs in history. I wonder if you hide the smut books really well. I wonder if you project a certain image so that nobody thinks to ask you the questions about that sin. I wonder if you have a second bank account and credit card that your wife never sees. I wonder if you carry the accounting numbers over and make sure that no one's aware of the money that you're stealing from your job. I wonder if you know where the CCTV cameras are at work so that you can slip the extra supplies into your pocket as you walk out. I wonder if by the lies of your life you direct people's eyes away from what you've done. I wonder if by the drinking or the watching of things or by the consumption of food or by the, the use of all sorts of uh, narcotics maybe that you try and silence and bury the blood that stands against you in to the ground of your mind. Burial never silences the blood of sin. Burial did not silence the voice of the blood of Abel. Look also at verse 13 of chapter 4. <coughs> Before we go there, another one's coming to mind, is that the seared conscience of Cain couldn't silence the voice of Abel's blood. You understand? It? God came to Cain, like a preacher of the gospel might do to you, non-Christian, uh, God's voice comes to Cain and says, you're guilty. And the unbeliever, you, like Cain, say, I don't feel guilty. I don't mind that my brother's gone. I have blood on my hands, but I don't think it's blood guilt. Oh, we redefine these things these days, Lord. It's actually just called a personality. Uh, it's just called, a, uh, I did an Enneagram test and I'm just a wing three. I'm not a liar. I'm just, uh, I, have, I have this uh, mental diagnosis. It's called hypersexuality, not fornication. I don't mind. I'm okay 
Maybe you, you even mock right now and you go, this guy thinks I care. He's saying, I hope you're shaking with fear. I'm, I'm pretty good. Your preaching's powerless. I'm perfectly fine and I enjoy my sin. I wonder if that's you. I wonder if like Cain, you, you don't really hear. Do you hear the blood of Abel? Cain didn't hear it. He was going to go back to his farming and live out his best life now as the favorite son again. He didn't care. But God heard. So your seared conscience, you're, you're ignoring, you're, you're callousing yourself, you're turning down the volume of what you know is right and wrong in your mind, the, 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 the trying to put some years and some distance between you and your sins and, and pretend it doesn't bother you, and maybe it really doesn't. Your seared conscience doesn't stop God's perfect ear from hearing the voice of Abel's blood. Look at verse 13, like we said before, verse 13. <clears throat> Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Oh, doesn't he sound very contrite? Oh, he feels terrible now. So he's going to call up his pastor and he's going to cry. I killed my brother and somehow I'm the victim now. Feel bad for me. Your brother's dead. Oh, I know. I feel so, so, so bad. Can you pray for me? He murdered his brother. God tells him, now your life's going to be terrible and horrible forever. And Cain says... That's sad for me. Attrition is what theologians call the feeling of grief and and deep regret because you're going to get punished. Contrition is what we call grief and deep regret because we have harmed and broken God's law and his heart. Contrition is godly. Contrition leads to change. Contrition is based on God, not me. It loves God, not myself. It centers God, not myself. Attrition is me-centered. It's, it's, I feel sorry for myself. Won't you feel sorry for me? And that's what Cain had. He felt terrible. He was crying and God was so mean. He didn't even, he didn't even abate and he didn't even throw away the cursings and say, oh, well, if you feel bad, Cain, he held that cursing over his head. He made it worse. He says, oh, no, no, it's okay. Because Cain said, oh, this is so bad for me. People are going to chase me and kill me. And God says, no, I'll make sure that you stay alive longer than most so that you can continue to bear your guilt in the land of the living to give witness to the voice of the blood of the innocent. Cain's attrition, his suffering and his weeping and his sleepless nights and his, his guilt and his bad feelings did not atone for sin. And we see something here by what is lacking. Do you remember when Adam and Eve sinned and God found them in sin? What did God do immediately after? He said, here is how you can approach me. Let me clothe you. Here's a sacrifice. He showed grace and love and mercy even in that moment of condemnation and cursing of the entire world and all of their progeny. And God doesn't do anything like that for Cain. God says, Cain, I gave you a system of sacrifice. I warned you not to see your conscience. I met you immediately after your sin. You seared your heart. You refused to hear. You spurned my religion. Therefore, go away. I offer you no sacrifice. I give you no right of plea or appeal. You go, you die, you burn, goodbye. There was no mercy because there was no sacrifice that could atone for blood in a faithless soul. And therefore, there's no sacrifice. There's no animal. There's nothing. There's nothing that can silence the voice of Abel's blood after Cain has now shed it. And I hope that you've seen by analogy how every single one of us stands outside of any kind of hope and outside of any kind of salvation or or helping or or usefulness or, or, or nearing to God. There is no way to do it. The blood of our sin, the blood of God's law, the blood of those we've murdered or hated is upon our own heads and there is nothing to remove it because nothing to a holy God whose image was implanted upon those souls that we've hated and sinned against. The holy God who listens to justice and the holy God who listens to the value of human life, that God hears nothing louder than the blood of Abel and those like Abel. Oh, but for Hebrews 12 verse 24. He hears the voice of Christ. He hears the blood of Christ. 
He hears the voice of Christ's blood louder than the voice of Abel's blood and stronger than the plea of Abel's blood and all the blood that is upon you and me for all of our sin. Let's read it again. Hebrews 12, verse 24. We have come to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Let me tell you how Christ's blood speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Do you want to hear it or shall we close now and study next week further? Do you want to hear the the voice of Christ's blood and how it avails for you? Let's go. First of all, I need to say, it does cry. The voice of Jesus' blood cries out. It is no stagnant blood. It is no mere event that happened to a me human in me human history 2,000 years ago. And some upstarts took the story, mythologized it, turned it into a religion. And now here you stand, you suckers, giving money to church, time to church, life to church for something that will never avail you beyond the grave. Remove that thinking the blood of Christ screams supernaturally. It cries out. The blood of Jesus Christ cries out. And look at where it cries out. It does not cry out from Jerusalem. It doesn't cry out from Calvary or Golgotha. It cries out in the presence of God. It cries out in heaven. It cries out in God's dwelling place. The blood of Christ cries. Where, where, God, uh, uh, where a- Abel's blood first said, where Abel's blood cried out, God, look upon my life. It is extinguished. Look with rage, justice, and wrath against my oppressor and my aggressor. The blood of Jesus cries out, Lord, look on my blood and forget the blood of my oppressor. Leave the life of my oppressor. Leave the life of my murderer. That is why he cried out as he was bleeding, Father, forgive them. The blood of Jesus cries out just like the voice of Jesus cried out on the cross. It cries out for no condemnation but for forgiveness. As if Jesus was on the cross saying, God, look upon my life. Look upon my perfection. Look upon my victory over sin. Look upon my my, my unblemished nature. As if Jesus on the cross and in the garden of Gethsemane said, God, look upon me and give to me the cup of your wrath. Give to me the cup of wine to drink, the blood of your anger. I will consume it all. On the cross, he cried out for God's wrath against himself. On the cross, Jesus cried out for God's justice, rage, wrath, and penalty against himself so that now in heaven his blood can cry out, God, look upon the life of those who believe in me and give them mercy, give them justice, give them kindness, give them eternal love. The blood of Jesus cries out. The blood of Jesus cries not for condemnation but for forgiveness. Thirdly, the blood of Jesus cries louder than the blood of Abel. It speaks a better word, and that's why it speaks forgiveness, but let's also say that it it speaks louder in the ears of God. It cries out louder in the ears of his father. Like Calvin said about Abel, we could say of Jesus, he was quiet like a lamb going before its shearers is silent. He was quiet in his suffering. He opened not his mouth, the prophet says. Jesus did not rise up in his own defense. He did not cry out of the injustice being done against him. He did not try and escape. He did not scream out uh, of the injustices that the Sanhedrin were committing against him. He did not cry out. He was silent. And yet in his death, he is loud. That is to say that the death of Jesus speaks louder than the guilt of your sin. The atonement speaks louder than your iniquity. Justification speaks louder than condemnation. Forgiveness speaks louder than accusation. God's grace speaks louder than those things that you have committed against his law. So let me say this. I know, I know your sin speaks. Maybe your conscience hears it because you're not like Cain. You're awake to your sin. I know your sin speaks. 
And you hear it in the other room, crying for your blood. You hear, you hear your, your sins in the other room, crying for your death and for your life and for God to extinguish you. But you hear in heaven, don't you? You hear in heaven the voice of Jesus, crying out mercy, grace, perfection, love, righteousness, justification, adoption, glorification. You, you hear the voice of your sin, and there will be no pastor to tell you, God doesn't care, you don't need to worry about it, your sin's no big deal. Silence the voice of your sin by, by burying it, or by searing your conscience, or by lying about it, or protesting your innocence. Those things don't work. The only reason the voice of your sin is now silenced to God is because he answered what it asked for. Your blood called to God, saying, Kill this sinner. Destroy the soul. And at Calvary, God said, I am, I did, I have. It is finished now. I, I killed Tom in Jesus. I killed you in Jesus. That's what the Father says. The sin and the blood and the voice that cries out against you has been answered, not ignored. God has done in the flesh of his son what the law could not do. By sending his son in the likeness of human flesh and for sin, he has condemned sin in the flesh. The voice of the blood of your sin has been answered and fulfilled. There is more merit in Jesus than there is uh, in Abel. There is more merit. Do we even need to? Oh, let's say that again because it's so obvious. Do I even need to say it? There is more merit in Jesus than there is in you. I thought you said I have infinite value as being made in the image of God. I'm like, yeah, an image has less value than the thing. Nothing is more valuable than you in creation because you're a human. God's not in creation and you're who you, he's who you derive value from. Invaluable, sure, still not a speck on the scales compared to God himself. And that's what Jesus is. God in flesh. Therefore, in Jesus, there is more merit, more righteousness, more value, more life, more power, more ontological glory than in any of us. And therefore, just like in Abel, that's why his blood can speak a better word than Abel. The blood can cry out in power louder than a million, a million worlds filled with you. If you lived your life a million times over, committing sins continually worse than the life you've currently lived, still then, the one death of Jesus and the blood shed for you would scream out louder than your life. There is more merit in Jesus than in you or I. And here is the glory. What makes it efficacious or effective, productive, complete, what makes Jesus' blood and his voice so effective is that it is heard. The blood is crying out to the Father. And Friday afternoon, Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon, Sunday morning, the world waited to see if the blood of Jesus would be heard by the Father. And in the turning away of the stone, and in the rising from the true and better Abel from the ground which swallowed him up in death, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead was the Father telling the entire world now and for eternity to come. The blood cried, I heard yes a million times yes to Jesus and everyone that comes to me through him. His blood will make many sinners righteous, full stop, underlined, written in blood. Therefore, Isaiah 53 prophetically said, it was the will of the Lord to crush him. That's why it worked. It was his will to crush him. Him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. Isn't that the opposite of Abel? When Jesus dies and sheds his blood, he will make many children live. He will not lose his inheritance. He will prolong his days by dying instead of having his days cut short in death. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. That is, what Jesus set out to do will be accomplished. Verse 11, out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, make, will make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. 
Abel's blood, though it was buried, still spoke. Jesus' blood, though it was buried, still spoke. The blood of the ground, the the ground which swallowed the blood from the very place he was killed, spoke for Abel. And the very cross where Jesus was killed now speaks for us and declares righteousness, justification, and forgiveness. (coughs) Jesus is in heaven. Jesus' blood, whether visible in heaven or merely true in heaven, speaks and speaks loudly for anyone who has come to God by faith in Jesus. My question for you is, is it speaking presently for you? Is Jesus, you, you don't need to find a savior to die. It's done. You don't need to find a volunteer to be crucified. For, it's done. You don't need to think up a way to get a perfect person to transfer, transfer merit into your account. It's done. The blood is shed. It's done. He's resurrected. It's done. He's sitting in heaven. It's finished. The only question is, has your name been added to the covenant? Has your name been signed upon the contract which stands in heaven in the enrollment of the firstborn? Does the blood avail for you? Does it presently cry out for you? The only question, the only way to answer that question is to answer this, have you placed your simple, weak, human faith and trust in Jesus who died? Have you placed your faith there? Because nothing else can wash away your sin. What can wash away your sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make you whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my pardon, this I see, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For your cleansing is your plea, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can for sin atone, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Not of good that you have done, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all our hope and peace, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all our righteousness, nothing Nothing, nothing but the shrieking, crying, singing voice of the blood of Jesus. Have you placed your faith in him? Have you trusted in that blood? Have you called for it to scream for you? Do so now. Let's pray. How precious is the flow that makes us white as snow. There is no other fount that we know or could think of or dream of, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Thank you, God, for your word that attests, the same word that Jesus' blood attests, which is that all those who come by faith in him to you will be accepted, will be made righteous, will be forgiven, will be cleansed, will be received as sons and daughters, will be added to the kingdom and will be kept for all ages. Lord God, please press upon our hearts the truth, the glory, the wonder of this truth, including and especially those who stand off like Cain, who try and excuse their own guilt instead of admitting it. Lord God, would you give them faith in this moment right now that they have never had before to rest to lean, to trust, to have faith in the blood of Jesus Christ shed for sinners like them. We pray all these things in Jesus' wonderful name. And everybody said...